Um, so this morning, we're fortunate to have Sigrid Carlson with us. Sigrid, of course, is right across the street. Um, she's done some great work uh, in terms of prostate cancer screening. Uh, Sigrid got her MD and her PhD from Gothenburg University in Sweden, and then her master's in public health from Harvard, and has been across the street at Memorial for the past decade. She's, her, her research has been funded by the Prostate Cancer Foundation, as well as the NCI through a K award. Uh, Sigrid, welcome, and uh, thank you for doing this for us this morning. Of course. Thank you, Dr. Hu, and good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see you, even if it's just in a small window on a screen. Um, <laughs> I just realized it's, you know, 10 years that I've been here. It's, it's, you know, time flies, and especially with the pandemic, we lose our sense of time. Uh, you know, I came as a postdoc, and it was supposed to be one year, and then, you know, I got another year, and then so I never went back to, to Sweden and it's been a wonderful journey. Okay, so let me see if I can share my screen if I remember how to do this after all this time. Okay. So I'm gonna put this in presenter mode. Okay, how's this? Tell me if you see what I see. Looks great. Okay. okay. So um, I was thinking today we could talk about um, risk stratified screening and early detection of prostate cancer. So, you know, feel free to ask me questions, type in the chat, unmute yourself whenever you have questions. You know, it's, it's hard to do these online talks. You feel like you're talking into a, a black box. Uh, so, you know, anytime, feel free to jump in with questions. So these are my disclosures. And as Dr. Hu mentioned, I've, I'm grateful to have funding to do the work that we do to benefit patients. So it was quite a, a bit of a, a culture shock to move from the rural countryside and the Swedish forest into the concrete and the Manhattan skyline. But luckily we have you know, our green space in the, the lung of New York City, so Central Park. So it's wonderful to be in this city that has everything. So as you know, um, PSA screening reduces prostate cancer mortality. So I've been a member of the ERSPC trial and the Yotaboy trial for over 15 years. And our trials show that regular screening of men reduces prostate cancer mortality. So this was one of the reports from ERSPC and we have then shown similar findings from the Yotaboy trial. And you can see that with extended follow-up, the, the crocodile gap, if you will, between the two arms continues to, to improve over time. But in the PLCO trial, the US trial, there was no evidence of a mortality benefit um, between organized and opportunistic screening. So this has often been interpreted as a big no, you know, one trial saying it doesn't work and then two trials say, you know, saying it does work. So I don't know, Dr. Hu, how you feel about this, but this has been my perception of the debate for a long time. Absolutely. Yeah. So then the US PSGF came in 2012. And you know, as we know, screening is not only beneficial, but it comes with certain harms. So overdiagnosis, over treatments, and side effects from, from screening and treatment. So they concluded that, okay, we need to stop this. So they gave a screening a D recommendation. So that was recommending against screening. So they said that screening does not, um, the benefits do not outweigh the harms. But this was unfortunate and uh, received a lot of pushback from the urologic community. I'm sure you all remember that AUA when this guideline was released. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, was um, an opinion shared by many that you know, PSA screening can actually have benefits, but how can we do it better so we can reduce the harms? So you need to then <laughs> turn to uh, papers by um, Dr. Hu and colleagues. This is a fantastic paper that he wrote together with Jonathan Shog and colleagues showing what explained this no finding in the PLCO trial, that a lot of men got the test in both arms. So it's very simple to understand then that it's, it's difficult to find a statistically significant difference between the two arms if everyone is getting screened in both arms. I don't know, Dr. Hu, if you want to comment on the findings of this study. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, I think we, were, we were curious why there was different contamination rates that were being cited. I remember David Pinson cited, you know, maybe a 50% contamination rate and, um, you know, really Yoni with his brilliance uh, sat down and already had the, the, uh, the data and in fact had done some nice publications with Chris and others 
Um, so uh, he put his, you know, when Yoni puts his mind to something, uh, good things happen. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad he was able to find that flaw. Yes, and we're happy that, you know, it was shown because it was unfortunate that, you know, the European trials had demonstrated the benefit, but then that was overlaid by this negative finding from PLCO, but that was not the whole story. And then when you took this into account, this contamination um, and using modeling uh, from the CISNET group, then you could actually see that both trials provide compatible evidence that screening reduces mortality by 30%. And here's another brilliant study by uh, Dr. Shogun and who um, showing that this benefit that we see actually improves over time. So, you know, the numbers needed to screen and numbers needed to diagnose become more favorable over time. And that's also another unappreciated um, finding from, from these studies. Do you want to comment, Dr. Hu? I think the, uh, you're, you're kind to highlight my work. For, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm blushing here with the poor lighting, but, um, but basically we, um, we, we thought about the infographic that the Preventative Services Task Force provides, and we looked at that together in, in the work that we've done, Secret, and um, you know, we felt that the, the really the benefit-harm ratio was, was underrepresented and uh, wasn't really realistic, and hence that, that was really the, the reason why we pursued this with Ruth and her group who really did all the work. Mm -hmm. That's a, so important because a lot of those infographics, you know, say, the benefit is one in a thousand so between screening and control but here what you show you know with longer follow-up that number becomes more like one in a hundred you know it's a big difference so uh, it, it really depends when you create these decision aids what numbers you choose and what you put in them because people make decisions based off of those numbers so it's important that you tell the, the whole story um, so that, so we really appreciate this this paper so then what happened after the USPSTF 2012 is that, you know, we saw an increase in incidence of, you know, higher stage and grade at diagnosis. So this was a paper that one of my students, Catherine Fleschner, she's now becoming a surgeon. Um, she wrote this paper. And then since then, again, another paper by Dr. Hu and, and uh, colleagues, we now see an increase in metastases consistent with these decreases in, in PSA screening. So we're observing now that the, changes that took place after the USPSTF 2012. And then the death rate from prostate cancer then has now stabilized. You know, it used to have this downward trend, but now it's sort of flattening out. Dr. Hu, do you want to comment on this and these observations? I think, I think it's, you know, everyone says it's um, associational. It's difficult to really get a handle on attribution, if you will. But I think, as I'm sure you'll talk about and historically, when we, what we've seen with the advent of PSA screening and the decline in mortality, one would conclude that unless there's a confounder like obesity or something, you know, worse prostate cancers, somehow there, the, the effect is presumably due to the decreased screening that occurred after the advent of PSA screening. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So then what can we do to do this better? I mean, we can all agree that there are harms with screening, so we can't just say it's all beneficial. So uh, the, the question is, you know, abandoning screening is not the solution, right? And we shouldn't screen everybody. That's not the solution either. So we need to do something smarter. So can we screen some men? Can we biopsy some men? And can we treat some men? And this way we can hopefully improve this equation. So we came up with what we call the five golden rules. So the first is get consent. So engage in shared decision-making. I think we can all agree on that. And number two, don't screen men who won't benefit. Three, don't biopsy without a compelling reason. Four, don't treat low risk disease. And five, if you have to treat, refer men to a high volume provider. So let's go over these five points uh, one by one. So we should do shared decision making, yes, but how do we do this? So Dr. Hu and I and our colleagues went through 21 decision aids that are out there in this online library. They're used in clinical care. So we reviewed this carefully and, and took a look at, you know, what do they look like? And to our disappointment, we found that many of them were written at a too high literacy level, and they all contain large numbers of numerical estimates. And as we discussed, questionable estimates, you know, it really depends what numbers you put in. And many of them fail to highlight this concept of active surveillance, that it's an important strategy to mitigate the side effects of screening. Dr. Hu, do you want to comment on your impressions of decision aids? Well, I mean, I think I think you you're the expert in this area. I think certainly, um, you know, as uh, you and Andrew have talked about, um, there's a certain number of numbers that uh, 
the, t- the average person can keep in one's mind, right? And so I think, um, you know, certainly in the infographic that the, uh, the Preventative Services Task Force put out, I think it kind of overwhelms uh, men uh, with, with a lot of these statistics, which are also sometimes difficult to interpret. Yeah. And, you know, it, even for highly educated people, it's hard to, to understand numbers. And people tend to think about risk as, you know, either it happens or it don't. So it's really hard to comprehend the numbers. And especially if you have, you know, 10 of them at once, how do you, you know, integrate all those in your head and to make a decision? So this is part of my career development award from the NCI to, to develop a, a new decision aid that doesn't overload people and overwhelm them with information, but can help them decide. So then don't screen men who won't benefit. Well, who are they? Well, if we don't screen elderly men, we could almost halve uh, overdiagnosis. So um, stopping um, early is an important concept. But on the other hand, we don't want to say, you know, 70 is a a hard cutoff, but it's important to take into account, you know, a man's life expectancy and comorbidities and the benefits of of treatment versus uh, competing risks. So then we can also draw upon the knowledge from my colleague, Dr. Hans Lilia. Uh, I think he has been uh, to a lot of research in in Malmö and in Sweden and found um, some blood samples, which has been really terrific. We have these cohort studies of uh, frozen blood samples and PSA is extremely stable over long-term follow-up. So we can use this knowledge to, to learn about how to use PSA as a baseline screening test. So what we found is that PSA, even though we say it's a poor test, it has you know, bad specificity, it, it, you know, it, it can be elevated because of BPH and, and inflammation and that's more common than cancer. So that's all true. But as a prognosticator, it's an extremely uh, good marker. So the area under the curve is 0. 0.90 for a midlife PSA in predicting lethal outcomes. So what we know is that here's an example of uh, a PSA at age 60 and predicting metastases and death. So you can see that 90% of deaths occurred among men who had a PSA above two at 60. And on the other hand, if their PSA was below one, they had an extremely low risk of dying from prostate cancer over long-term follow-up. So this is, you know, men followed for 20, 25 years. So 0.2% risk for men below one. So we can then use this knowledge to um, stratify screening and determine who needs more frequent screening and who could, you know, maybe be exempted from further screening. So when we compared then this MALMA study to the Göteborg trial where men were screened every two years, we saw that the benefit was mainly contained to those who had a PSA above two. So if you continued to screen those men, you had a large reduction in cancer mortality and less overdiagnosis. But if you continued to screen you know, 72% of, of men who had a PSA below two, there was a risk of, of overdiagnosis, but not so much um, a reduction in metastasis and mortality. So we have then um, drawn upon these um, observations and incorporated those into our guidelines at MSK. So you can see here that our guidelines say that if a man is 60 and the PSA is less than one, then no further screening is recommended. Dr. Who, do you wanna comment on, on these? Um, on these algorithms? No, I mean, I think, I think it's um, very thoughtfully done. I just, um, you know, it, it, as you know, screening is always, um, you don't want to over screen and, and we, we still have these, these guys slip through. I know, I know we're, we're working on that um, analysis with Sierra Medicare and, and how there's an increased uh, likelihood of, of younger men really being diagnosed with higher grade tumors. And so, so I think it's never going to be perfect that you're, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to really prevent every prostate cancer death, but certainly the, the over, the uh, harm of uh, over detection and, and biopsies and so forth. I think this certainly mitigates that. Yes. Thank you. And then Dr. Mark Preston's uh, team and uh, we worked together and showed that the baseline PSA captures aggressive prostate cancer at least as well in black men as in white men. So this is a confirmatory studies from the Southern Community Cohort Study and the Physician's Health Study. And you can see that the, the PSA distributions are fairly similar. So uh, above the median at 50 is about over you know, 0.8, 85, 88. So it's, it's very uh, similar findings. So that's reassuring that we know that we can use baseline PSA as a risk stratifier. So then don't biopsy without a compelling reason. Um, We all know that if you live long enough, you will have prostate cancer uh, eventually. 
And then therefore we don't wanna put needles in men's prostates because we don't wanna cause any infectious complications or hospitalizations, as you know, uh, which has been on the rise for um, many years. So in the past, we used to only have the PSA test, but now there's sort of been an explosion of new uh, strategies on the market, including biomarkers and risk calculators. And we now have the new kid on the block, the MRI. And I can say that this is, you know, really increased in popularity, you know, exponentially in the past few years only. So here's just an example of some biomarkers. So that, that could be a whole talk in and of itself. But, you know, this list is, is ever growing every day. And we have the risk calculators that are, we can use. Here's, for example, the ERSPC risk calculator or the PCPT uh, risk calculators. And another simple thing to do um, before jumping to biopsy is just to repeat the PSA. And here's uh, Dr. Easton's landmark study showing, you know, the year-to-year -year fluctuations in PSA levels. So a, a pretty high proportion of men do return to normal when the, the value is repeated. So this has been incorporated into guidelines as well to repeat the PSA after a few weeks to confirm the elevation. So what about MRI before biopsy? This is one of the big questions and you know, one that we debate every, every time at the meetings in the past few years, you know, should we do it or, or, or not? So uh, the guidelines have changed rapidly. The, uh, the um, 2020 AUA position statement is that sufficient data now exists to support the recommendation of MRI before biopsy in all men who have no history of biopsy. And the NCCN guidelines now also say that it's recommended that MRI should precede biopsy uh, and image guided biopsy techniques be employed routinely. So this is a shift that's really happened um, recently towards um, incorporation of pre-biopsy MRI in the guidelines. And I think EAU is the guideline that takes this, you know, to, to um, furthers and says that MRI should be performed before biopsy. And in biopsy naive men, um, if the MRI is positive, then combine targeted is systematic. And if the MRI is negative and the suspicion of cancer is low, then the EAU guidelines says that um, biopsy can be omitted in, um, together with shared decision-making with the patient. But it's important to remember that the evidence for this in the guideline is weak, uh, the strength rating of, of the evidence. And that means that the generalizability that's seen in the studies um, might not be uh, translated into the real world practice. It really depends on, you know, where you are. And so, you know, in the community settings, it might not be the results of the, you know, promise or precision trials. Um, so it really depends on, on the expertise where you are. And then for prior negative biopsy, the EAU guidelines then says to perform targeted biopsy only when the MRI is positive. And then if it's negative and the suspicion is high, so perform systematic biopsy uh, with shared decision-making with the patient. So um, this is really, you know, changes in the recent years. Um, and it's really been discussed, being discussed among um, guideline uh, group. And the NCCN still says that um, we should consider um, combining the targeted with the systematic approach because a negative MRI does not exclude the possibility of not exclude the possibility of the so, so Sigurd, um, you know, you know Dan, Dan Margolis, Margolis is actually, actually on the call. Sorry. Uh, Dan, did you want to comment? I, I mean, Sigurd has this exactly right. I think we have good data to understand <laughs> the value of uh, yeah. MRI, um, but whether we should be performing just targeted targeted systematic, systematic or uh, we still don't uh, have enough data to in which patients need which, uh, which system. Exactly, thank you, Dan. Yeah, I think we need more data and... <laughs> So I think we can all conclude that, um, you know, from all these studies that have uh, been published in the recent years that MRI and targeted biopsy uh, can help make a correct diagnosis, but a negative MRI does not obviate the need for systematic biopsy as of yet. So uh, there was this recent systematic review. Um, so if a man is asking my MRI was negative, can I still have cancer doctor? The answer from the review then is yes. 
Um, so in reviewing 42 studies, the uh, negative predictive value was 91%, so a miss rate of, of 9%. And you can see here, there was a substantial heterogeneity between the different studies. And the same, if the MRI was positive, but the biopsy was negative, can I still have cancer doctor? And again, uh, the answer is yes. So uh, the NPV was 93%, so a false negative rate of 7%. And we know that this is true, um, you know, about the variation. Even experts um, at Stanford, you can see here, nine radiologists have different um, detection rates. So the interpretation of MRI varies substantially. And then we have the unanswered questions, and Dr. Hu is attempting to answer one of these with the randomized trials of transperineal versus transrectal. And then we need more information on the magnetic strength and whether we can. Um, um, omit one sequence and just do the biparametric MRI. I don't know if you want to comment on the use of MRI. Yeah, the, um, I mean, I think it's here to stay. I, I was, I, I, you know, I don't want to steal your lightning or thunder rather, if you, you were going to kind of mention, I know um, Andrew kind of has a position in looking at some um, observational databases at how many, you know, high grade cancers do we really miss, right? Um, if we didn't use MRI, which is very, I think provocative, but it's one of those things I think in urology and in medicine where we're similar to robotic surgery, you know, the, uh, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak, and unlikely to, uh, to get it back in the barn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. There's, you know, undoubtedly a role for pre-biopsy MRI. The question is whether we should use it routinely or have some sort of algorithm for when it should be used. Um, so there's more to come. And as I mentioned, you know, there's this saying, uh, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So to be successful, this concept requires, you know, high quality MRI machines and optimal readings of the scans and training of radiologists and then access to high quality um, uh, targeted biopsy also. So it depends on, you know, do, do you hit the target and do you hit what you see? So uh, some interesting um, concepts going forward could be to use um, uh, a sort of multi, a multiplex test or a, a three-step approach where you start with the PSA, then go to a reflex test and then a, 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 an MRI. So here's an example of the Stockholm 3 test uh, that is a multiplex test combining calocrine markers and genetics and, um, and clinical information. And then, so using this test together with MRI then improved the detection of clinically significant disease, but also reduced overdiagnosis. So, you know, something like this could, could be one way forward. And there's a lot of research going on in this field now and other biomarkers being studied in this context. So then uh, number four, don't treat low risk disease. So sometimes the best thing to do is nothing. So even though active surveillance isn't really doing nothing because we're really actively following these men, uh, it is important to, to have this in mind and not you know, think about immediately jumping to, to treatment as was you know, done in the past. So many cohorts around the world uh, of active surveillance, and here's just an example of our experience uh, here across the street at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where we show that active surveillance is a safe strategy over, you know, 10 years of follow-up with a very, you know, small risk of distant metastases. And the nice thing is that, that the treatment-free probability remains high, so you can see that about half of men remain untreated at 10 years. Sigrid, um, if I can ask you, um, because I remember, and and, and you may be speaking about this, but it's kind of um, the paradigm for active surveillance continues to evolve. I was on the, I was on the phone talking to uh, Bafar about, you know, some of the, as you said, the randomized control trial. And I think he mentioned that the memorial is switching to a every three year um, biopsy for men on active surveillance. And I think it used to be that the, the, there was also mentioned on the last slide about the confirmatory biopsy. I, I believe previously it was to do a confirmatory biopsy within six months of diagnosis. And so how, can you comment a little bit on how those um, those uh, those metrics have changed a little bit? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. You know, in the past, you know, there was biopsy all the time and very you know frequent monitoring. But I think to make it you know better for patients and improve their experience, we need to have a sort of more uh, dynamic uh, program or a, a program you know that's um, where we monitor risk and then you know we we can do other ancillary testing. And here, MRI definitely has a role too. Uh, you know, if, if we have a suspicion, then 
we confirm, you know, with the PSA, DRE, and MRI, and then that might prompt a biopsy. But other than that, you know, extending the, the biopsy intervals, uh, I think, um, is the way to go. Because, you know, we know from the Swedish trials that many men with low risk cancer can live for a very long time without any doing anything at all, right, with a old watchful waiting cohort. So I definitely don't think we need to um, be as, you know, have a high vigilance of, of testing and biopsy every year. What is your view? No, I think that's exactly right. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the role of prostate exams evolve. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm doing a lot of those just to uh, do a rectal swab as part of the control arm for the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, you know, targeted prophylaxis. But, but you just kind of wonder, you know, I, I know it's going to be something that's, um, controversial to say, look, we don't need to do prostate exams anymore. But at the same time, if, if modern management is regular MRI testing, you just kind of question the role of that. Um, but um, maybe heresy for some, you know, to some of the uh, more traditional practitioners, but I think that that study needs to be done. Yeah, I agree. You know, anything that's not invasive, of course, is preferred. Um, whether we can replay some of the biopsies, you know, I mean, there's been multiple studies on that. And so I think you know, that is still investigational, but I think that's, you know, where we where we're moving. So then finally, if you have to treat referment to a high volume provider. Um, so why do I say that? Well, we know that, you know, whose hands perform your surgery matter. And patients often ask, you know, what can I do to prepare for my surgery? So, you know, one thing is to, to ask, you know, the, the surgeon, how many surgeries have you done? And what are your outcomes, you know, choosing your surgeon? And then, of course, you know, what can men do themselves? And we, can, we will talk about that in a minute with uh, prehabilitation exercises. So um, this is um, a slide from Dan Barocker's group. He, he gave a Grand Rounds talk recently um, showing, you know, elegantly that we know that these outcomes um, after prostatectomy, you know, it affects all domains of a man's life, basically, sexual function, urinary function, bowel function, and this is for um, surgery, radiotherapy, and also a little bit with active surveillance. So it's important, you know, to have this in mind, because, you know, this is what it means for the individual man and, and his family, you know, this uh, can really have a deterioration on quality of life. So I think you saw this paper recently in the New York Times, are robotic surgeries really better? Uh, and as Dr. Hugh mentioned, you know, um, the, the, the horse is already out of the barn, you know, we already have the robot here. And this has been, you know, an interest of, of Dr. Who's for many years to, to compare uh, the effectiveness of the different surgical modalities. And it's also been one of, of my in research interests. So we, we've shown then that the who, who performs your surgery uh, can have an effect on outcomes. So this is um, an example of, um, you can see that the size of the bubble in the graph here to the left is uh, proportional to the number of surgeries that uh, the surgeon performs. So you can see that the larger bubbles have better outcomes, both in terms of functional and oncologic outcomes. And in the figure here to the right, you see the surgical learning curve, and this is for open prostatectomy. So it, it takes a fair number of, of procedures, you know, before you can really master the procedure. So this is important. And what we've shown then from the Swedish LAPRO trial that intended to, to compare the two surgical modalities was again, this uh, massive heterogeneity in all uh, these three outcomes. And when you took surgeon volume into account, when you compare open and robotic, that really had a significant impact on the results. So, so this really questions, you know, can we do randomized trials in, in surgery? And, you know, does it depend on the surgeon more so than, than the tool that the surgeon uses? So, uh, Doctor Who, do you want to comment uh, on this? Yeah, no. I mean, I think I think you're exactly right. The um, when, whenever in, in submitting, you know, now two RCTs to the the study sections at the NCI, I think the most common criticism that you'll have as a surgeon trying to do a trial is you need a surgical guide that is to standardize how the the you know control arm and the intervention arm of the different surgical techniques is performed and. Um, I think that's incredibly difficult to do, obviously. So, uh, so it's one of the. I think there's opportunities for machine learning, um, you know, uh, which um, uh, will will help with us help us with this in the future. Yeah, I mean, it is an interesting question and one that we discussed. You know, we had a webinar at BGI, uh, and you know, pretty handy. The editor in chief, you know, he, he a PI of the Protect trial. You know, he's a, he's a purist. He's a RCT, you know, big proponent. I mean, he would of course 
advocate for um, the randomized trials, even for, for surgical procedures, because how will we otherwise know? Um, so um, it is interesting. Uh, I really- How much, how much did uh, PROTECT cost again? I think it was what? <laughs> Yeah, you mean you see the numbers, you know, I'm always impressed by the number of, you know, the dollars and the pounds that he's gotten for uh, in research grants to support yeah. the studies. And the number of people involved in the trial, you know, it's, it's a ph phenomenal, you know, undertaking. Sure. No, I think so. So, you know, my point there is that um, if you're going to do something like Protect, which was, gosh, I, I don't know, maybe a hundred centers, whatever it was in the UK, then I think then you get a better sense of what's going on because you have average outcomes of everyone if you were going to do a surgical trial like that, right? But but it's yeah. just so so expensive to do those trials. I mean, I think it was, you know, millions, millions and millions of dollars, maybe 30, 40 million dollars, right? So yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the downside with you know, large randomized trials. They're costly, they take a long time to, you know, perform, you know, waiting 10, 15 years for the outcomes. So, you know, how do you how do we get the level one evidence that we want? Uh, the other thing you can do is, you know, a single surgeon series, but then, you know, that's again, one surgeon's experience. So it might not be generalizable to, to the experience of, of all surgeons. So this is fascinating and we, we continue to learn. So urinary leakage, as you know, affect men's quality of life. And um, um, it's really something that we need to improve upon uh, after a prostatectomy. So, uh, together with Dr. Sandu, uh, we have an initiative here at MSK where we um, are starting to incorporate some prehabilitation pre uh, strategies. And you know, if this proves successful, this could become the new uh, standard of care. So together with Dr. Sean Mungovan, who's a physiotherapist in Sydney, Australia, we have learned a lot from uh, his knowledge and experience. He's been doing this for many years, and we uh, wrote this uh, review article as you know the, the evidence is growing on uh, starting pre-op exercises uh, before prostatectomy, and mainly focusing on, on pelvic floor muscle exercises. So not just simple Kegel exercises, but a more comprehensive um, a program of structured exercises with then biofeedback and using transperineal ultrasound where men can you know, see their muscles contracting in real time and thereby get you know, visual feedback that they're doing the exercises correctly. So starting these exercises four weeks before the surgery and then continuing after then improves uh, the hastens the time to continence. So that's what the studies are showing. Um, and here's an example of another study. So this is, you know, comparing prehab and rehab. So rehab, you can see that, you know, eventually over time, um, men do improve. So at one year's out, you know, the, the outcomes uh, improve. But with prehab, you, you hasten the time to continence and you reach continence faster. And that can really be important because, you know, you can, you can return to work faster and then you can, you know, focus on um, um, re regaining, you know, other... Um, um, so um, erectile function outcomes, for example, um, or uh, other side effects that you, you might be you know, suffering from that can be improved, you know, once your, your leakage has improved. So, so we, uh, we, yes. can blame the, we can blame the patients now. You're not exercising enough when they come, come in and they complain about uh, leakage. That's right. <laughs> So Sean always gives, um, has the allegory, you know, if he travels from Sydney to New York, you know, in, in business class, you might say it's a very nice experience, but uh, if this is what it looks like if he goes in coach. So, you know, you, eventually you will, you know, you will get to New York, but you will have a much better experience. So that's sort of the, the analogy that he gives that with exercises, you know, eventually, you know, you, you will get continent, but you will, you know, improve much faster with, with um, exercising. So then another um, important aspect is this of uh, the length of the membranous urethra, so the MUL. So here you can see uh, four men who are, they have the same age and the same uh, prostate cancer, but they have different length of, of MUL. So you can then see that, you know, men with, with higher uh, length of membranous urethra um, have higher uh, continence rates. And this is something that Dr. Hu and I have been interested in looking into more deeply. And we found that um, there is actually a racial disparity that Asian American men have 24% lower odds of, of urinary continence during the first year after prostatectomy. And then, you know, why, why is that? And we're still, still exploring that. And, and, you know, Dr. Hu found that uh, the MUL was significantly shorter for Asian men than for non-Asian men with a difference of three millimeters. And there might be, you know, other 
reasons as to to why um, we see these findings. Dr. Who, do you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I have to thank really, um, you know, Marcus, Lou, and others um, for referring me a lot of Asian American men. Uh, certainly, you know, having been in Los Angeles, I, I'd operated on some men, but, you know, my nurse practitioner, my former nurse practitioner, and I just noticed that a lot more of our um, Asian American men were just more likely to have, you know, significant incontinence after surgery, which, which led us to look at this. And I have to be honest, I mean, I know Scardino and Memorial have been big proponents of looking at MUL for, for quite some time, but you know, unless you kind of see it in your own patients, it's, it's, um, you, you don't really subscribe to that theory perhaps as much, but uh, it was certainly very eye-opening to see this. And I, I look forward to you know, the additional work that we're doing to kind of sort this out even further. Yeah, I think it's important for you know, communication also and expectations uh, to know what to expect. So then we can conclude the five golden rules. Um, get consent, engage in shared decision making. So start conversations about the benefits and risks of PSA at 45 to 49. Risk stratify and adapt the screening intervals to the man's age, health and prior PSA. Don't screen men who won't benefit. So limit screening in older men, limit screening in those with um, a PSA less than one at age 60. Don't biopsy unless you have a compelling reason. So repeat the PSA and work up for benign disease. Con uh, consider additional biomarkers and or MRI. And then recommend active surveillance for men with low risk disease and refer men who need treatment preferentially to high volume providers or centers. And then I've added number six here. So consider prehabilitation and rehabilitation strategies to improve quality of life after, after prostatectomy. So this way you can you know, shift the balance between uh, benefits and, and harms of screening. So uh, finally, um, um, I have a few minutes left on my talk. I wanted to, to share some, some insights uh, to uh, residents and fellows of, of what I've learned as a physician scientist in this field. And you know, feel free anyone to chime in if you have comments. So um, something that I'm thinking about every day is how do I find support for my, my research idea? You know, I can wake up and have a lot of ideas, but what do I do with them and how can I uh, ensure they get funded so, you know, I can translate the, the benefits back to the patients. And then number two, you know, how do I get my manuscript published and I can share some of my knowledge as an editor of uh, BGUI. So uh, here are some keys and some tips and tricks. These are just my personal opinions, but I, I hope you know some of it might be useful to you. So my dad always used to say, you know, a, a human is only a human among other humans. So uh, it really is important to choose wisely the the people around you and the people you work with. And you know, I've found that the most um, successful of my projects have been in diverse teams. So uh, diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, and gender, and uh, experience and expertise in, uh, you know, different uh, fields of, of medicine. So talk to your peers and show them your specific aims and rewrite them probably 20 times before you, you submit. And then take a course in, in grant writing. So that's what I've done. Um, and I think it's been very helpful. You know, it's, it's very formulaic. You know, you need to learn sort of what are the pieces that go into, you know, can't, you can't just have a good idea and then you know just write whatever you want and then try to sell it to the grant agency but it really follows you know a structure and there are pieces that they want to see and that they expect to see and you kind of have to far far you know follow the recipe and then this is something super interesting and you know this guy is a neuroscientist and i saw this tweet and i was like wow <laughs> you know and i printed this thing so can anyone tell me what you think this is Are these all the grants that he submitted? Yes. Wow, that's so pretty this, amazing. It's pretty amazing. I mean, it's a very you know uh, prolific guy, and so you can see here, you know, year by year, 2017, 16, you know, the number of grants. What else do you see in the to to the right in the picture? The red, the green, the failed success. Exactly. So the red are the, you know, that he calls failed. And then, you know, the greens are, you know, the, those were grants that were funded. And I was like, oh my God, this is exactly what my grant folders look like. You know, I was like, I thought I was the only one. And you know, I keep submitting grants. You know, I keep, you know, every year, 10, 15 grants. And I keep throwing like spaghetti on the wall and hope something sticks. And I'm not the only one, you know, it's like, it was, you know, this whole normalizing the experience, you know, this is a, you know, a professor, neuroscientist, 
and his folders look like mine you know i'm not the only one who fails you know all the time but you know it's it andrew you know a statistician andrew Rickers, he says you know it's all about probabilities you know you just have to maximize your probabilities and the only way to do so is to submit grants so um this has been super helpful you know to me just to know that you know, I'm not alone, you know, other super experienced people experience the same thing. And I'm sure, you know, you have been very successful, Doctor Who, at getting, you know, our ones and big grants, you know, I'm sure this is all you do, too. Do you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I think Chris, Chris, as well as others, um, you know, it's, it's certainly a process. I think that the best advice given to me was writing grants is like writing science fiction. I mean, you're not trying to, you know, be deceptive, but you're certainly trying to, um, Trying to be very optimistic about the impact of your research. I think, uh, you know, you being at Memorial and working with a great team, obviously, a lot of grantsmanship is is also the environment and uh, and the investigators. And so, if you go in with good people, at least you have those, and, and at a good place, you have those two things covered. And then worry about the the approach, significance, and innovation. Obviously, um, so um, it's 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 tough, but hopefully the funding levels come up at the NIH a little bit and uh, everyone will share some success. Exactly, I hope so too. So then, you know, once you've decided, okay, I have this great idea, I have my team, I'm gonna do this. Um, what I've learned, um, uh, an advice I got from, you know, some random person, that, you know, just listen to this in D train, keep on. I'm like, what is this song? So I turned it on and it's like this funky music that just puts me in a great mood and I just you not know, start typing away. And so this has been my, you know, grant writing uh, uh, song. And, you know, he has many others that just you not know, keep, I keep them on my playlist. And for some reason it works. So, you know, my grants admin make fun of me, <laughs> you know, when the keep on comes on, like, you know, okay, don't disturb her, you know. I put a sign on my door grant writing in progress don't disturb and then they know what's going on so i don't know it, it helps me get into the flow uh, and then my trainer george you know he's like who says i can't you know nobody says five more push-ups you're not a quitter so i think you know that attitude has also helped you know translate into my workplace you know and with grants it, you know sometimes you you know especially before the deadline you, you hate it you just want to be over with it but you just have to write those significant you know that last section so you just you just have to keep going and you know not quit and again with the failures you know don't take it personally, it, you know, usually it's not you, it might be very competitive, it might be other things, you know, God knows what's going on. So, you know, you just keep doing it, keep, you know, don't quit, don't give up, just, you know, back up on the horse and, and keep submitting more. And then so finally, how do I get my papers published? Uh, and we say follow the guidelines. So we have created some guidelines and um, this is what's driven by um, Melissa Assel, Dan Soberg, Andrew Vickers and other statisticians in the field. And it's really an effort, you know, to improve the quality of statistics in urology papers. And this is a, a uniform um, initiative with European Urology, Journal of Urology, BGI, the Urology Journal. So um, it's really to help everybody you know, to um, improve the way we report statistics in papers. So, you know, a lot of papers land on my desk and, and I try to, uh, you know, give the author's guidance on how they could be improved in terms of the reporting. So I think this guideline is a really, really helpful document for everyone writing manuscripts and adhering to the guidelines will, you know, improve the, the likelihood that the paper will be accepted because, you know, it's, it's a really nice, again, formulaic way of, of thinking about your, the way you write your paper and your statistics so that it's, you know, much more easily readable to, to every audience. And also this, this question, uh, now that I know this, what do I know? You know, this is how I often feel as an, an, uh, you know, an editor when I read papers and, you know, it's like, okay, so what, you know, the authors didn't have a clear question or clear hypothesis, you know, the conclusion is just something, you know, vague or uh, uh, nothing, you know, how do I take this home? How do I bring this to my clinical practice or what are the next steps in terms of research from this study? So, so now that I know this, that I've seen your paper, I've read your paper, what did I learn from it? You know, what, what is the take home message? So a lot of the papers don't have any. So I was like, what, why did you submit this paper? No, I mean, it's, it's um, uh, think about that, you know, from the start, you know, why is it that you want to uh, write this paper? What is your question? What's your hypothesis? And then finally, some words of, of wisdom here in COVID times. Um, 
we're all you know struggling hard and, and living day by day so time is all we have and don't so so stop and smell the roses when you can thank you for your attention thanks Sigurd. that was great i um i liked how you i think that was also your some of the pictures for your father right so that's nice that you um you kind of uh you know brought him in in with the pictures and his quotes um and so so for the um you know, I know you work with a lot of the fellows, um, so and, and this was very practical advice. I mean, I think sometimes, as you, as you've probably seen with the fellows at Memorial, everyone's so focused on, if you will, the immediate gratification. That is, you know, learning how to do the clinical things and so forth. And so, uh, and I know you've kind of shared your perseverance with getting grants. These these um, um, you know, being an editor, these papers, and so uh, so. Can you share like kind of what? What has inspired and driven you to continue to be so uh, productive and uh, you know fired up about screening for prostate cancer and decision making? It's a good question, you know, one that I keep asking myself, you know, after all these years, you know, it's like stirring the old, you know, it's PSA over and over again. Uh, I don't know. It's just this deep fascination that I have of, of and the curiosity, you know. Uh, and it started with, you know, Professor Hugoson and his group in Göteborg. You know, he was like, "Do you want to do summer research? Do you want to try it out?" I'm like, "Sure." And I had no idea what I embarked on. And it was just this really wonderful, amazing group. And you know, urologists are the, the best people in the world. They're, you know, throughout the world, they're they're always super fun and super nice to work with. So it's really been this wonderful, supportive environment. And then. You know my um, academic interests in science and you know randomized trials and evidence and you know so we we have screening mammography we have you know cervical cancer screening but why don't we have PSA screening you know that's how how it started you know 15 years ago and so since then you know it's evolved so enormously and it's so rapidly and you know the evolution we see in biomarkers MRI you know risk certified screening it's just so fascinating to be a part of that journey and you know, improving the way we think about it and improving the benefit, improving, you know, reducing the harms and, and just, you know, being part of this. And so bringing the benefits, you know, back to, to men, because, you know, prostate cancer is such a significant problem. And, and if we can be you know, a part of it and improve some of it, you know, I'm very grateful to be part of that journey. Fantastic. Um, you know, in terms of shared decision-making, I, you know, you know, Chris Seigel very well, I'm sure. And, you know, Chris, of course, uh, uh, at UCLA overlapped with me during residency. He's the vice chair and, and he has a, a tool, as you know, Wiser Care, which I think is, I think UCLA has actually incorporated into their, their epic functionality, um, their, their electronic medical records. Do you see that as perhaps the, you know, the most efficient way, you know, someone goes in, for example, uh, the day before they're logging on, just like they're entering their past medical history, their medications, and then they're getting their preferences for different states of, you know, cancer cure, erectile dysfunction, incontinence being, being kind of whatever, whatever it is, time trade-off or visual, visual analyze score, getting those um, queries done before they come in and see the, the doctor, right? So, so thoughts about the future of shared decision-making, how best to do that? Mm -hmm. I think definitely, you know, more patient autonomy in their own decision-making is, you know, where we should be, of course. So the question is, how do you do it and how do you do it well? Uh, some decisions are more amenable to shared decision making than others. Um, so, you know, decision support tools can definitely help, I think. In terms of, you know, prostate cancer treatment decision making, we've always been had the opinion it should be risk based, you know. So for low risk, we know, you know, active surveillance is often, you know, the, the, the first, the preferred option. For high risk, we also usually know, you know, how to treat. But then there's, you know, men with maybe low intermediate risk who are sort of on the verge of, of active surveillance versus active treatment. And I think that's the space where shared decision making can, you know, really play a role. Um, and then, you know, what tool to use? I think we need to to study more and how to do it. Um, a lot of this, you know, the, the preference elicitation and values clarification tools are pretty complex, you know. Um, Kahneman and Tversky have shown this, you know, the problem with affective forecasting, it's hard to imagine future health states that you've never been in. So, you know, asking someone to trade off, you know, how you feel about living one year longer or being, you know, incontinent, you know, I don't know, I, I, I have never been. So uh, that I think can be tricky. And I think that's where the physician with their knowledge can help guide the patient. So 
you know, thinking about preferences is maybe having sort of a values profile. This is where I'm leaning towards. What do you think um, can help guide those decisions? But I don't know if, you know, putting numbers and weights and things um, is really the solution in, in using these tools. Uh, I think they should be used more as a, a conversation guide together with the decision. Does that help answer? No, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think that there's, well, you, you know, you're, you're doing great research in that area. I don't think there's, you know, I don't think we know the best way yet, right? I think we're, we're trying to, it's such a, as you know, time consuming process as well for surgeons. And, um, you know, how do you, how do you get those points across in terms of differences and outcomes with these different competing strategies? So yeah. very, very challenging thing, of course. And I think what you said about, you know, giving them maybe the tool ahead of time so they can have looked through it, you know, there's, you know, Cochrane reviews showing that decision support tools, you know, help educate people. They feel more knowledge about uh, about their options when they come in, and so, and, and they are maybe more clear about their values. So I think that's the benefit of these tools that they have read about it, thought about it, and then they come into you, and then you can have a, a fruitful discussion. Excuse me. How far in advance do you start doing exercise with patients uh, for the, the rehab, the prehab, as you call it? Thank you, Dr. Sternberg. It's nice to, to hear your voice. Um, the, what Dr. Mangovan has been recommending to his patients, it's starting about four weeks before surgery. Yeah, so about a month. So these are primarily, these are patients that don't exercise, do exercise, every, everyone mixed together, and it's different exercises than they usually do, I imagine. Yes, a good question. So, you know, Sean would know all the details about the, the program. You know, it could be a combination of you know, physical aerobic exercises, you know, going for walks and, and things like that, but also the pelvic floor muscle exercises. So the way his program is that he has physiotherapists that, that help, you know, guide the patients and they have a, a training program and they're given, you know, a, an exercise schedule and, you know, uh, with resistance or without and, and, you know, following sort of a, a, a program. So being, being coached in, in how to do it. Good idea to do it before. It's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. Sigrid, it's nice to see you. It's been a long time. You too. Hi, Dr. Lee. Hi. You know, we've tried to do prehab in the past, you know, at least in, in the U.S. We've, we've run into sort of reimbursement issues, patient compliance issues. I'm curious to hear how, sh I, I, I'm, I imagine the healthcare system is a little bit different in Australia. Do, do you have any insight as to how Sean has been able to sort of overcome that locally? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't have any you know, insights into that. It's, it's a good question. And, you know, the number of exercises that you can get reimbursed for and so on, I don't know how exactly that would work. But uh, he's telling me now that, you know, with COVID, he's transitioned to telemedicine uh, a bit. So, you know, they don't have to come in necessarily to see the physio for all the exercises. So that could, you know, increase the uh, translatability of, of the program and for patients to adhere to the program. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Well, listen, uh, Chris, did you have any comments or questions? Oh, that's a great talk. I really, uh, we, I really appreciate your insights. Yeah, we, we, uh, you know, it's great. I, I, when you try to put together with the faculty the kind of schedule, of course, you want, um, you know, people from diverse backgrounds. You mentioned the importance of diversity. Um, I'm sure you saw some of the tweets this this weekend, uh, and kind of. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we certainly need role models like yourself, uh, particularly, you know, in prostate cancer research. So Sigrid, thanks so much for doing this. Um, you know, I, I noticed how you've uh, maybe unintentionally, your, your color coordinated, your, your, your you know, jacket nicely uh, accentuates the, the bouquet in the background. So, uh, so very, very nice touch. It was my birthday yesterday. So oh, happy birthday. Thank you so much. I've forgotten, you know, with COVID, like, what am I turning this year? You know, <laughs> it's the sense of time, you know, there, there is no time, but the time is all there is also. So well, good. Well, listen, thank you so much. This was wonderful and uh, look forward to uh, continued collaborations. Thank you for the opportunity. And it was great seeing you all. Take care now. Thank you.